the constitution of india preamble we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice social economic and political liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship equality of status and of opportunity and to promote among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation in our constituent assembly this 26th day of november 1949 do hereby adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution hi children how are you hope you are healthy and happy i know you are preparing for the exam don't worry don't take any tension relax yourself be cool and plan according to the timetable surely if you are confident and you are believing in yourself you will be able to perform very nicely one thing you have to keep in your mind my dear children never compete and compare with others we know that human being is having the tendency to compare and compete with others instead of comparing and competing with ourselves you should have a healthy competition where you have to compete with yourself compare with yourself where you are standing now and from there how much work or how much effort you want to take to reach the top surely it is said to be healthy competition my dear children steve job said a quote be a richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter me going to the bed and saying we have done something wonderful that's what matter me i think you would have understood this quote nicely just go through this quote again and again surely you will be understanding what i mean to say related to comparing and competing with others by saying this i move on to the next session where we are going to recap the previous class and in the previous class we understood about leaf where we studied that or understood that leaf is a flattened outgrowth on the stem and the function the leaf is doing such as transpiration photosynthesis and respiration and we understood about the parts of leaf leaf base which is also called hypopodium and next one petiole which is also called mesopodium and the third one is lamina or leaf blade which is also called epipodium and in next part we understood that leaf is having veins which is also acting as a channels to transport water mineral and food material and we have gone through this figure related to the leaf later on we studied about venation it is the mode of arrangement of the veins and veinlets in the lamina and venation is of two type reticulate venation and parallel venation that also we understood in the previous class and later on we have seen the figure related to parallel venation as well as reticulate venation next we came to know that there are different types of leaves that is simple leaf and compound leaf in the case of simple leaf it is said that leaf with single lamina and the simple leaf we can see in the plants such as hibiscus and compound leaf 
is a leaf with two or more lamina or leaf segment an example is neem tree you can see this is simple leaf and this is compound leaf this also we understood in the previous class and again we understood that compound leaves are of two type pinnately compound and palmately compound and the picture or the figure related to pinnately compound and palmately compound that also through that also we understood which what is pinnately compound and what is palmately compound and then we understood about phyllotaxy it is the pattern of arrangement of the leaves on the stem and it is of three type alternate phyllotaxy opposite phyllotaxy as well as world phyllotaxy and related to phyllotaxy we have seen the figures also alternate opposite and world and i think you would have understood related to phyllotaxy later on we studied and learned about modifications of leaf same thing we understood in the case of stem as well as root also so in the case of modification of leaves we understood that leaf tendrils are formed an example for leaf tendril is p gloriosa number 2 is leaf spine example for leaf spine are cactus pineapple and then figures related to tendril and leaf spine we have seen and the third one is fleshy leaves example onion garlic fourth one is phyllod all these are the modification isn't it in the previous class we studied about it related to phyllod example is australian acacia and in the case of insectivorous plants also we can see leaf modification in picture plant utricularia isn't it as well as in the case of venus flytrap and these are the figures related to the modification of leaves taking place in plant that also we understood later on we understood about inflorescence an axis bearing a cluster of flowers are known as inflorescence example crotalaria this is what we have studied previous class this is the inflorescence where you can see the cluster of flowers are present there isn't it and if a single flower is present there seen there in the plant we can say it as solitary flower and we can see in the case of hibiscus and related to inflorescence it is been said that there is a common axis which is called peduncle isn't it this is the common axis which is called peduncle and based on the nature of peduncle we understood that inflorescence is divided into two group racemos and cymos that also we understood in the previous session and this part i told you is very very important isn't it huh? this is cymos and this one is racemos figure related to it also we understood and next we came to know about the next part that is flower so there ends the leaf now the next we came to know about flower a flower what is flower flower is a sexual reproductive unit in angiosperm and a flower is a modified reproductive shoot why it is said a modified reproductive shoot reasons are there that also we understood in the previous class that is it is been said that the stalk of the flower is called pedicel the upper part of the pedicel is called the thalamus which is also known as receptacle or torus and the thalamus it is bearing four floral whorls and these whorls are calyx corolla androecium gynoecium calyx is the sepal which is green in color corolla is the petal which is colored and androecium is the male reproductive part and gynoecium is the female reproductive part so that part also we understood previous in the previous class and then we understood related to the terminology for describing a flower what is bisexual what is unisexual what is actinomorphic what is zygomorphic and what is asymmetric trimerous tetramerous bracteate e bracteate so these are certain terms used there for describing the flower 
and then we came to know that based on the position of floral leaves the thalamus isn't it based on the position on the thalamus flowers are of three types the floral leaves which are present on the thalamus based on that position flowers are of three type that also we understood hypogynous perigynous and epigynous from the term itself hypo above isn't it gynosium is above the other parts peri that is it is said that gynosium is present in the center isn't it and other parts are almost will be seen on the same level and epi means inside that is ovary is enclosed inside the thalamus so these are the three types of flowers based on the position of floral leaves on the thalamus that also we understood in the previous class and based on that thing we see in the figure also isn't it this is hypogynous where it is been said as ovary is superior it is perigynous it is been said that ovary ovary is half inferior isn't it half inferior this half, half inside and epigynous inferior ovary that is completely the ovary is inside so these are the three types of flowers based on the position of floral leaves on the thalamus and i think you would have understood about it very nicely now we are going to learn and understand about the parts of a flower each flower has four whorls already we understood that thing isn't it calyx corolla androecium and gynoecium number 1 is calyx it is the outermost whorl of the flower in the flower this one you can see this is the calyx this is calyx which is also known as sepal it is composed of sepals you can see here this green part which is covering the colored part that green part is this part this is calyx this one is calyx isn't it when the sepals are free in this case we can see sepals are free when the sepals are free it is said to be polysepalous poly stands for free so poly means free sepalous means sepal it is been said that when the sepals they are free they are not connected with each other they are not fused with each other they are separated from each other in such condition we can say it as polysepalous next one if the sepals are fused it is said to be gamosepalous you can see here sepals are fused here isn't it they are connected with each other they are fused in this condition we can say it as gamo gamo means united or we can say fused gamo means united and sepalous means sepal so fused sepal or gamosepalous so sepals if they are free they are called polysepalous if the sepals are united or fused they are called gamosepalous i think you would have understood about it my dear children that is related to calyx number 2 this, this is the second whorl in the flower and that is called corolla it is second whorl of the flower it is composed of petals petals are brightly colored when petals are free it is termed as polypetalous and if the petals are fused it is termed as gamopetalous so you can see here isn't it when we see the hibiscus flower open completely open we can see the petals the colored part of that flower the petals are separated from each other they are not connected they are not being joined or fused with each other such type of flower in which the petals are free it is called polypetalous and in certain flower we can see the petals they are connected with each other isn't it so in that case if the petals that is in such flowers if the petals they are fused with each other we can say it as gamopetalous okay my dear children so this colored part is petal so i think you would have understood about polypetalous and gamopetalous now based on the flower itself we can study the next term that is astivation it is very very important 
it is said that the mode of arrangement of sepals or petals in a flower bud is called astivation that is how the sepals and petals they are arranged in the flower bud in the flower bud we can see the sepals and petals they are arranged differently how they are arranged that phenomenon or that process is called astivation the mode of arrangement of sepals or petals in a flower bud is called astivation i think you understood what is astivation and the main types of astivations are number 1 this one this is valvate astivation this is twisted astivation this one is imbricate astivation and this one is vexillary astivation so how many types it is 1 2 3 4 types of astivation we have seen just now isn't it the arrangement of petals or we can say the arrangement of sepal based on that thing astivation is taking place in the flower and the first one is valvate you can see how it is been arranged isn't it that is the petals they are just touching or they are free from each other you can see here one petal this is second petal this is third petal fourth and fifth petal they are just only connected slightly with each other such kind of arrangement is valvate but in the case of twisted you can see what is happening 1 2 3 4 5 petals are there you can see this is one petal that is one part is in it is seen in the interior the other part is exterior one is inside and the other part is outside same way in the second petal also we can see one part is inside that is the one end of the petal is inside the other end of the petal is outside the third petal also we can see one is inside the other end is outside the fourth one also the same way you can see the one end is inside other one is outside and in the fifth one also the same pattern we can see so this type of arrangement if we can see in the flower related to the petal or sepal is called twisted isn't it twisted you can see here itself one end inside other end is outside one end inside outside isn't it inside outside inside outside inside outside so like this kind of arrangement if you are seeing there in the case of petal or sepal we can say it as twisted now in the case of imbricate we can say that here the arrangement is irregular the arrangement of petal or sepal is irregular as you can see here this one this one petal this one petal is completely outside it's both the end is outside seen outside but on the opposite to it you can see this petal both the end is inside and why it is been inside because the other petals one end is seen outside and the other end is seen inside the same way here we can see one end is seen outside other end is seen inside isn't it here also we can see one end is outside other end is inside so five petals are there and in this five petals one petal is completely outside and the other petal is completely inside and the other three petals they are outside inside in that pattern they are arranged such kind of arrangement is known as imbricate you can see here one petal is completely outside the other petal is completely inside <clears throat> but the other three petals you can see the arrangement outside inside outside inside outside inside such kind of arrangement is called imbricate now in the case of vaxillary this is somewhat different from the other three types of astivation and this is a peculiarity of leguminaceae plant or we can say fabes fabesi family and in this case you can see this one is the standard petal this one is the biggest petal and this one is the standard petal and this petal is completely covering the other two petals and these other two petals they are completely covering the other two petal which is almost inside isn't it and 
the almost inside petal which is present there it is connected to each other in the form of a boat shape you can see it is in the form of a boat shape such kind of arrangement is known as vexillary arrangement or astivation and this astivation we can see only in fabaceae family which is also known as leguminaceae which is also known as pulse yielding plants such as pea plant now you would have understood about it i think isn't it my dear children so this are the four types of astivation we can see in the plant related to the arrangement of corolla isn't it so you can see in detail about it now what is astivation it is arrangement of sepals and petals in the flower bud and first one we have seen just now it is valvate margins of sepals or petals do not overlap but just touch each other example calyx in the members of malvesi calotropis and anon anona isn't it same way number 2 twisted or convolute or contorted one margin of each petal or sepal overlapping on the other petal already i told you about it example petals of china rose which is also known as hibiscus number third is imbricate this is one of the form of imbricate okay imbricate sepals and petals irregularly overlap on each other one member of the whorl is exterior one interior and rest of the three having one margin exterior and the other interior example cassia delonyx all these are the example of imbricate astivation and number 4 is vexillary large posterior petals both margins overlap internal petals lateral petals other margins overlap anterior petals example pea and bean so i told you that is related to these four astivation one is valvate number 2 is twisted number 3 is imbricate and number 4 is vexillary this is very very important my dear children you have to study it because this figure used to come in the question paper and based on the figure the questions are asked in the examination so you have to study it very nicely now again you can see here astivation the arrangement of petals and sepals in the flower bud and what is valvate here the floral leaves such as petal or sepals are arranged side by side side by side like this isn't it same way twisted here the floral leaves show regular overlapping in one direction only you can see one direction like this in one direction it is that's why it is you can see in this flower hibiscus isn't it here only in one direction the overlapping is taking place so this kind of astivation is called twisted astivation the next one is related to imbricate in cassia flower we can see the imbricate astivation where it is been said that when both the margins of one member of the calyx or corolla are overlapped and both the margins of other members are external and remaining are twisted in nature that astivation is called imbricate and as in the case of imbricate astivation i told you one petal will be completely outside the other petal will be completely inside and the remaining petals they will be in the twisted manner that is why it is called imbricate astivation and the last but not the least is vexillary it is rare and found in pentamerous flowers only here two petals are innermost these are innermost two petals are outermost two petals are outermost which is alternate and here the posterior petal is in the form of a standard petal which is at the top isn't it this one is a posterior petal and this is standard petal and it is at the top and this petal is overlapping the petals two petals present there and this two petals they are overlapping the inner petal isn't it in this manner the astivation is taking place there and this type of astivation you can see here 
this is the flower Fabaceae flower is not it in this flower pea plant if you are seeing you can able to find out the activation related to pea plant flower and the same activation you can see in that flower also my dear children. So, just take the pea plant flower and go through the activation related to vexillary this activation is very very important it used to come in the question paper I think you would have understood about activation. So, that is related to corolla. So, we have completed, completed the second whorl of the flower that is corolla. Now, the third whorl of the flower is androsium. It is a third whorl inner to the corolla. It is composed of stamens. Each stamen has a slender stalk called filament and an anther. So, this is the structure of stamen where stamen is having a filament and it is having anther. This is anther and this is the filament. Filament is connected to the anther by a connective. Each anther is bilobed. You can see two lobes are there. One, two. These two lobes. That is why it is called bilobed. Okay. Huh? And each lobe has two chambers. And in each lobe we can see two chambers. This is one, this is two. This is bilobed. One, two. And in this one lobe itself we can see one and two chamber. Similarly, in another lobe we can see this one and two chamber is not it. So, like this we can see four chambers are there in the two lobes of anther and these two chambers they are called these two chambers which are present there it is called pollen sac and pollen grains are produced in the pollen sac. In this pollen sac what is present there? Pollen grains are present there which are known as male gametophyte pollen grains are known as male gametophyte ok. So, that is related to the stamen I think you would have understood about stamen and related to the stamen the another thing which we are going to study is adhesion of stamen. What is adhesion? It is been said that fusion of the members of the dissimilar worlds is called adhesion. Dissimilar worlds means when the stamen is being connected to corolla or calyx or gynosium we can say adhesion that is dissimilar world fusion of the members of the dissimilar world is called adhesion. You can see here it is of three types epiphyllous epipetalous and gynandrous epiphyllous epipetalous and gynandrous what is epiphyllous stamens unite with parient and what is parient parient means tepal t e p a l tepal and what is tepal tepal means where we cannot differentiate calyx and corolla in maximum flowers we can say that calyx is present there or sepal is there which we can differentiate from the corolla is not it as corolla is in different color and calyx in, is in green color. But in certain flower we will not be able to differentiate which is calyx and which is corolla. In those flowers we have to give the term perianth they are also known as tepals ok. So, here when the stamen they unite with the perianth we can say it as epiphyllous ok. Epi means united and phyllous is perianth. Example in the case of asparagus in the case of asparagus we can see epiphyllous type of condition. Next one is epipetalous. Stamens unite with petal. Epi means united and petalus means petal. When the stamen unites with petal, this condition is called epi petalus. Example in the case of datura, it is a plant, it is a flower where we can see epi petalus condition. Okay. And gynandrous. Stamens unite with gynosium. Gyne. Gyne means gynosium. Andrus means androsium. 
where stamens are the part of it, isn't it? So, when stamens unite with gynoecium, it is also called gynandrium or gynostig gynostigium. Example in Calotropis, this is Calotropis, this is the condition where we can see epiphyllous condition, is not it? Uh, that is sorry, this is epipetalous corolla, you can see this corolla, is not it? And the flower both are the petal, they are the stamen is present here and the stamen is connected to the corolla, and this one is the condition that is called epiphyllous condition, is not it? Epiphyllous condition. And this one is gynandrous. Here you can see the gynoecium is united with sepal. So, these are the three types of adhesion of stamen we can see in the case of certain flowers. This is important again, my dear children. Now, the next one is related to cohesion of stamens. What is cohesion? Fusion of members of the similar whorls is called cohesion similar worlds, is not it? Usually three types of cohesion among stamens are taking place. They are in that adalphus you have to study and what is adalphus? Anthers remain free and filaments are united. In this case the anthers are free but the filaments they will be united there and adalphus conditions it may be monoadalphus diadalphus or polyadalphus. What is monoadalphus? United to form one bundle. Example, China rose. You can see this one. Is not it? Here anthers they are free, but the staminal tube is formed there. Here you can say they are completely in one bundle. Is not it? The staminal tube it is being connected, the filament is connected. Anthers are free, but the filaments are united there with the staminal tube. Such condition is called monoadalphus, that is, they are seen in a single bundle. Now, diadalphus united to form two bundles. Example, in case of pea plant. In the case of pea plant flower, we can see diadalphus condition, that is, you can see this filament, is not it? This is a separate filament with the anther. And the other filaments they are united with the anther, anther they are free, but the filaments together they are in one single bundle. So, here we can see two bundles, this is one bundle, this is second bundle. So, two bundles are formed there, is not it? This type of arrangement is called diadalphus condition, and the third one is polyadalphus condition, where united in more than two bundles example in the case of lemon. In the case of lemon you can see these are different filaments where they are being united together. More than two bundles are formed here. The, here only two bundles are there, here only one bundle, but here more than two bundles we can see in the case of the stamen, is not it? Uh, and Similar world, similar bundle is there, isn't it? Similar cohesion is taking place here, but bundles are more than two. Such condition is called poly. Poly means more than two, isn't it? So, such kind of adalphus is known as poly adalphus and it is taking place in lemon type of plants. I think you would have understood about cohesion of stamen. This is also very, very important. Monoadalphus one bundle, diadalphus two bundle, polyadalphus means they are seen in more than two bundles. I think you would have understood about the cohesion of stamen. So, that is the third whorl of the flower. Now, we are going to study about the fourth whorl that is gynoecium. It is the innermost whorl of the flower. It is composed of carpels. Each carpel has an ovary, style and stigma. You can see there, this is the structure of a carpel. You can see this is swollen base. This swollen base is the ovary and a slender tube like structure you can see here. It is the style and 
on the style we can see the stigma. So, these three constitute the structure of carpal and inside the ovary we can see ovules, is not it? You can see here ovary encloses ovules and ovules are attached to a flattened cushion like structure and that is called placenta. Ovules they are seen on the cushion like structure and that is called placenta. I think you would have understood about the structure of carpal and what is carpal? Carpal it is the part of gynoecium and what is gynoecium? It is the innermost whorl of a flower. Now, Based on the number of carpal, gynoecium is classified into different types. Monocarpillary, bicarpillary, tricarpillary, tetracarpillary, pentacarpillary, multicarpillary like this different types of we can see the terms related to the carpal based on the numbers. Mono, mono means single, carpillary means carpal. It is a ovary with a single carpal. Ovary, if it is having a single carpal, we can say it as monocarpillary. Example in the case of B. Bicarpillary, it is a presence of two carpals. Bi means two carpals in an ovary. In the ovary, if two carpals are present there, we can say it as bicarpillary. Example, solenum. Solenum is nothing but it is, we can say as chili or brinjal. In them, we can see bicarpillary type of carpal. Tricarpillary, it is the presence of three carpels, is not it? Example, cocos. Tetracarpillary, it is the presence of four carpel. Example, in the case of cotton plant. Pentacarpillary, it is the presence of five carpels. Example, hibiscus. Multicarpillary, it is the presence of many carpels. Example, anona. So, all these are the examples related to the carpels present in the ovary such as monocarpillary, bicarpillary, tricarpillary, tetracarpillary, pentacarpillary and multicarpillary. You can see here two united carpels, these are the two carpels together, is not it? Yeah? Here you can see three united carpels, one, two and the ones, one will be in the back side. So, three carpels are united here. So, you can see here one, two, three, when we are taking the section of it, we can see three carpels together. And here you can see four carpels are together 1, 2, 3, 4, is not it? And in this case 5 carpels are there, if you are taking the section we can see 5 carpels 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that is related to the number of carpel, gynoecium is classified there into different types. Now based on whether carpel is free or united, gynoecium is classified into two types, here also we can see carpal sometimes they are free, sometimes they are united. Now based on whether carpal is free or united, we can classify gynoecium into two type. Number one is apocarpus, number two is syncarpus. Apo means free, syn means united. So if the carpal is free, here when the gynoecium consists of two or more carpels and all the carpels are free, you can see the figure here, is not it? These are the carpels and they are free from each other. If such condition we can see in the flower, we can say it as apocarpus. Now next to here you can see all the carpels are, they are separated, they are free from each other. In such case we can say it is apocarpus. Okay? Now number 2 is syncarpus, here the gynoecium consists of 2 or more carpel and all the carpels are fused, syn means fused or united, here the gynoecium is consists of 2 or more carpels and all the carpels are fused, you can see here, is not it, together they are there, they are fused, see, this is the fused condition of the carpel, such condition is called syncarpus. See here in this case the carpal is fused with each other in this condition we can say that it is syncarpus. So based on the carpals if they are free or united we can classify gynoecium as apocarpus or syncarpus. I think you would have understood about it my dear children. 
Now again one more term is there that is placentation and what is placentation? The mode of arrangement of ovules on the placenta within the ovary. We have seen just now inside the ovary ovules are present there and we also studied that ovules are seen on the cushion like structure called placenta and what is placentation then? It is a mode of arrangement of ovules on the placenta. How the ovules are arranged on the placenta within the ovary? That kind of arrangement is called placentation and there are different types of placentation we can see in the flower. Number one is marginal placentation. From the name itself we can say that the ovary is one chambered which is also known as unilocula. Uni means one, locular means locule that is chamber. Okay. Uni means one, locular means locule and that is called also or we can say it is also known as chamber. So, in this type of placentation we can say that ovary is only one chamber and the ovules are born on the ridge forming two rows. You can see here this is placenta isn't it? This is placenta and on the margin the ovules are formed on the margin of the this is ridge here yeah, the ovules are formed isn't it? In two rows we can see such type of placentation is known as marginal placentation and in the case of P when we are taking the P pod isn't it? When we are opening it we can see such structure there. If you have not seen it my dear children today itself you go to the kitchen take the P pod complete pod you can take and try to open it surely you will be able to see such structure there. This is marginal placentation. I think you would have understood about marginal placentation. Second placentation is axile placentation. It is found in multicarpillary, syncarpus and multilocular ovary. Already we know that what is multicarpillary that means where the carpels are more than two. Syncarpus means the carpels are united. Multilocular means having many chambers. That is, if the ovary is multicarpillary, syncarpus and having many chamber, we can see in such ovary axile placentation. And here the placenta bearing the ovules develop from the central axis of the ovary. Here what is happening? In the ovary, in the central axis, the placenta will be bearing the ovule. In example, China rose you can see here this is axile placentation in the center this is the central axis and you can see these are the placenta where you can see the ovule isn't it this type of structure is axile placentation this is marginal placentation you can see in the margin what is present there ovules are present there okay so I think you would have understood about axile placentation Third one is parietal placentation. It is seen in multicarpillary and syncarpus ovary. The ovary is unilocular. The one chambered ovary may become two chambered due to the formation of false septum. Septum means it is a formation of false wall. A pseudo wall will be formed there and that imaginary wall will make the ovary two chambered. But originally the ovary is only one chambered. In the normal way we can say ovary is one chambered but what it is being said it becomes two chambered. Why? Because of the formation of a pseudo wall or we can say a septum is false septum is formed there in the ovary. So such type of placentation is called parietal placentation. You can see the figure here this is parietal. This is parietal isn't it? A pseudo wall will be formed here. This is a septum which is formed there and this septum is not present there. It is not there. It is not original seen there but it is a false septum. Due to that ovary is seen as two chambered. Understood? So that type of arrangement of 
ovule in the ovary is called parietal placentation i think you would have understood about parietal placentation now the next one is related to free central placentation here ovary is unilocular that is one chambered and placenta arises from the base of the ovary where the ovary is present from that from the base of the ovary the placenta is arising it projects into the cavity as a swollen axis and it bears ovule it from the base of the ovary it will be originating but it will be projecting itself into the cavity and as and how it is been seen as a swollen axis and there it is bearing the ovule in the case of prime rows we can see free central placentation you can see here free central see this is here no septum is present there nothing is present there isn't it just it is free in the center it is present there the placentation is present it is from the base of the ovary the placenta begins but it reaches the cav in the cavity and there the ovule formation is taking place and it is free that's why it is called free central in the free it is in the center part it is seen there and we can see it as a in such a way that the ovary is having two chambers but actually the ovary is having only one chamber such type of activation you can see in this case also isn't it this is here you can see a septum is there we can feel here septum is there but no septum is there it's false this is called false septum such type of placentation is called parietal placentation i think you would have understood about it and the fifth one is basal placentation here ovary is unilocular again it is one chamber the placenta develops at the base of the ovary from the name itself basal so placenta it is developing at the base of the ovary it bears a single ovule in the case of sunflower we can see basal placentation so this one is basal here you can see this is the ovary and in the base the placenta is developing and from there ovula form there so such type of placentation is called basal placentation my dear children you would have understood about placentation and the different types of placentation this figure is very 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 important as related to placentation and different types of placentation in the question paper the question used to come and in your textbook the types of placentation is given there you have to go through those figures and you have to study it as i told you just now question related to those figure the figure will be given in the question paper and based on the figure the question used to come in the examination this is very very important i think you would have understood about placentation next is related to fruit a fruit is a ripened ovary when the ovary matures and when it ripens it is called fruit the structure of fruit fruit consists of a swollen modified ovary wall which is known as pericarp what fruit is consisting it consisting of a swollen modified ovary wall ovary is having a wall and that wall will be modifying and forming a swollen structure and that swollen structure is called pericarp enclosing the seeds arranged on the placenta okay and what and pericarp consists of three parts epicarp which is also called exocarp it is the outermost layer mesocarp it is the middle layer and endocarp it is the innermost layer so this part is again important the pericarp what is pericarp pericarp is the swollen modified ovary wall we can say in the common way ovary wall is also called pericarp ovary wall is to pericarp and pericarp consists of three parts outer layer middle layer and the innermost layer outer layer is called epicarp or exocarp middle layer is called mesocarp and innermost layer is called endocarp you can see here this is the outermost layer which is called epicarp inside to is there is a one 
tissue you can see here isn't it this yellowish fleshy tissue which we can see here that is mesocarp and then there is inside the seed here inside there is a seed and that seed is covering a layer that layer is called the endocarp so these are the three parts of pericarp is very very important my dear children you have to learn it this is also used to come in the question paper here you can see in the case of mango and coconut this figure is there in your textbook also in the case of mango and coconut you can see here mango is having three part epicarp mesocarp and endocarp but in the case of coconut we cannot see epicarp the outermost layer we cannot see isn't it in the case of coconut we can see only two part one is mesocarp and the other one is endocarp that is this part this is endocarp this one is mesocarp and in the case of mango the outermost part is epicarp and inside that epicarp we can see a pulp area or the fleshy area that is called the mesocarp and after that fleshy area we can see the seed which is been covered there isn't it that covering is endocarp these are the three parts of pericarp i think you would have understood about pericarp now next one is related to parthenocarpic fruit my dear children fruits are of two type true fruits are there false fruits are there isn't it and the third fruit is parthenocarpic fruit you can see here a fruit formed without fertilization is called parthenocarpic fruit i told you fruits are of three type true fruit that is from the seed itself fruits are formed there and false means other than the embryo or other than the ovary if any other part for example thalamus the thalamus if it is producing a fruit so we can say it is a false fruit and the third one is pericarp where fruits are formed there but it is formed without any fertilization such fruits are called parthenocarpic fruit x and next one is related to drup in the case of parthenocarpic fruit we know banana they are seedless fruit orange seedless fruit isn't it now next one is related to drup what is drup simple fleshy fruits are called drup if the fruits are fleshy they are called drup drups have a fleshy or soft exocarp a fleshy mesocarp and a stony endocarp example coconut cherry peach isn't it apple all these are drup this is a drup this one is drup isn't it all these are drup and here you can see endocarp this one is exocarp and this is mesocarp so i think you would have understood about drup as well as parthenocarpic fruit okay my dear children so with this i wind up the session and in the next session we are we will be meeting again my dear children don't worry be confident believe in yourself and prepare for your examination surely you will be rocking in your examination all the best for your exam take care